And it is internal, so I'm always happy to be here. Um, I have been here a couple times before, although I can't quite get my head around the fact that it's been five or six years since I've been here. But uh, I've had some pieces played in the festival. I've presented my work here before, and I know that my work has been played here since, and it's, it's been floating around a little bit faintly in the background here for, for a few years now. Um, so it's nice because it feels like a bit of a safe space for me, a bit of a maybe a more favorable audience than I might otherwise sometimes expect. It's also nice to be here for this particular topic that I want to talk to you about today, um, because my talk today is going to be something a little bit different for me, uh, a little bit more reflective, <laughs> um, a little bit more retrospective, because what I want to do is prevent, present, as Aaron said, this piece that I wrote for orchestra a couple years ago, um, so a relatively new piece, a relatively large piece, um, which contains the wide open spaces of the title that I gave to my talk before I knew what I was going to be talking about, running and hiding in wide open spaces. But I want to reflect on the nature of this orchestra piece and the thought process that went into making it the way that it is. And specifically, I want to talk about what that process says about the rest of my work um, and how it made me think about the rest of my work and its broader context. And to present this piece, this orchestra project, as the sort of moment of reckoning for me that it was in reference to my own work um, in stylistic terms. And I want to sort of raise the idea of style not in a sort of glib, sort of superficial way, um, not mere style, not style as the sort of superficial appurtenances of a sort of compositional brand. Um, although I don't want to totally dismiss the idea of a compositional brand either, that'll come up later. But style in a more rigorous sense, style in a more profound sense for me, in a personal sense. Um, for me, style is the sum total of one's musical axioms, right? It's those things that aren't relitigated in every piece, those things that aren't touched by the compositional process per se, those things that come beforehand those things that aren't subject to modification by the whims of, the momentary whims of life while you're writing a piece. Style are those things that make the compositional process possible, um, for me at least. Um, so by style, I mean one's personal universe of compositional possibilities, um, or I mean the, the boundary conditions of that universe. Everybody has these. It's what makes it possible to get up in the morning, sort of compositionally speaking, and also maybe literally, um, although some people's boundary conditions are more extensive and wide and permissive than others, of course. But what I want to want to do today is to walk you through a thought process by which my own boundary conditions were challenged, um, leaving for me in the sort of ambiguous, precarious state um, and questioning at the end whether the process of making this orchestra piece resulted in a modification of my personal style, my personal boundary conditions, or just sort of a clarification of what they may have been all along. Um, if this piece and the process of making it changed something or just revealed something that, in fact, was always the truth about my work. It's sort of a, a weighty subject, so bear with me. Um, so what I need to do first, of course, is to present a brief summary of what my work is, um, what it was before this moment of reckoning happened, how I presented it in the recent past. Um, I'm going to illustrate with a relatively recent example um, that epitomizes my compositional style in the form in which I was forced to confront it. So what I'm going to do first, before I get to the orchestra thing, is play you a reference piece. Um, a piece that I, that I sort of picked as being more or less typical of my style going into the orchestra, orchestral process. And this is a string quartet um, that I wrote in 2014, um, which I, I, it still feels kind of odd to me to be in a position where five, a piece that's five years old is a relatively recent piece, but here we are. Um, this piece is called Inscribed in the Center, Inscribed, comma, in the Center, colon, quote, 1520, comma, and Torf, close quote. I'll show you that in written form in a moment, so don't, don't worry about it. Um, I like these sort of awkward, unwieldy titles. And I'm going to play it first. Um, so I'll give those of you who don't know my work a very good sense, I think, of its relevant aspects of where I'm coming from. And I'll show you the score, which is even more relevant than hearing it, maybe. And I'll isolate and I'll highlight and summarize those aspects that led me to choose to show you this piece as an example of my style, um, of, of the boundary conditions that made it possible for me to write music. So what you have here is a drawing by Albert Dürer, which is in the back of the score of the string quartet. And I'm sure you can all tell quite easily that the smudge at the top, in fact, reads 1520, Antwerp. It's a drawing that Dürer made in 1520 of what is now Antwerp, uh, the port on the River Scheldt, on his tour of Europe in 1520. And this drawing, I'm a huge Dürer file to begin with, and a huge drawing graphophile, I guess it is. I love pen and ink drawings, pencil drawings, pens and pencils and all such things. But this drawing in particular, this is drawing has hung over my desk for quite a few years, starting a couple of years before I wrote this piece. And I've always been sort of sucked into it quite a bit by a couple of things about it that are really eerily relevant to my own work. Um, 
there are two related things, and the, the most important thing is this weird scenario wherein the detail of this drawing is most finely rendered and most densely rendered the further you get from the vantage point. Right? So the closer you get to the vanishing point of this drawing, the more brickwork there is on the walls, um, the more rings there are on the ships. This is, of course, the absolute opposite of the way that Renaissance perspective is meant to work, an atmospheric perspective where the color is supposed to fade and the detail is supposed to fade as objects in pictorial space get further from the viewer. Here, precisely the opposite happens. All the figures are crowded around the vanishing point, all the figures of little people on, on shore. Um, and in fact, there's so much detail at the vanishing point that you can't even really, it becomes a sort of chaos, right? You see these ships overlap to each other, these riggings and masts and customs house buildings and all this stuff. Um, this is not a great reproduction, of course, but I can assure you that even in the much better reproduction that I stared at for years, this is a indecipherable welter of detail right at the focus of the, of the drawing. Um, and of course, as you can see, the nearer things, the things that are essentially closer to you are unrendered blank floor, unrendered blank sea, unrendered blank sky, unrendered blank walls. Um, so the idea of detail that is excessive, that hones in on a, on a point of focus and then proceeds to wipe it over and make it something you can't really focus on is, as you'll see, as I'll explain in more detail, sort of a strangely perfect metaphor for my own work. And then the flip side of that coin is precisely this negative space, the fact that it's crushed on all sides by whiteness. Um, and of course, this is a sketch. It's not a drawing. It's a medium where the idea of it being finished or not is an irrelevant question, right? Um, I think it was just meant to be sort of a private. It's from his sketchbooks. This was not sold, exhibited, etched, whatever. Um, but the white space that becomes overwhelming and becomes unbalancing, and, and in the sense, in the opposite sense, poetically speaking, forced, forces everything in the draw in the drawing into this vanishing point. Um, Anyway, this, so the, the string quartet exists sort of alongside this drawing. Finally, I decided to make a piece about it. So I'll play it for you now. It's about um, 12 minutes long, and then I'll explain why I'm playing it for you, what it has to do with the rest of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so that's the title. You can now read it for yourself. Um, this is performance is it's the premiere, and much to my regret, so far the only performance of this piece by the Mivos Quartet from the 2014 Darmstadt courses. So that's I'll do my best to follow along. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, so I suspect I don't necessarily now need to explain why it was weird for me to write for orchestra, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, so the question then is, what is my style, right? Or what, how did I think of my style at the time that I was writing pieces, this piece and the other pieces of which I selected this as a representative? Um, and a brief, so the brief rundown of the axioms that defined the boundaries of the compositional world of this piece, um, those things, again, that weren't subject to question or reevaluation during the compositional process, the ways um, that I talk, thought about it for myself, um, with the caveat that I'm going to give you a list of four axioms as I'm defining them here, that they're, they're overlapping, and they inform on each other, they act on each other. And where we're heading is the possibility that it may be more productive to read this list as multiple approaches to some vague core of my musical personality. Um, but axiom number one is the score as a signifying object. Um, I've always talked to anyone who would listen about the fact that notation is my medium, not sound. Um, that the score and everything about the score and its paratexts are the content of the work, um, not the resulting events that you hear in a concert setting. Um, the sound of the concert is, in principle, a sort of a partial reflection or sort of projection into a um, lower dimensional space, uh, metaphorically speaking, than the, what I consider the work to be. Um, this is an idea that's only sort of maybe marginally here in practice, but I, you know, I like to sort of think of myself or th think about the medieval repertoires and the, the scribal traditions wherein in you know, the 1400s, 1300s, the sound of a work of music was only one aspect of it alongside the material conditions and the layout of the score and the illuminations and the, and the conventions of notation and so forth. But as a consequence of this, everything about the score ought to speak to the work itself and to function actively as part of the work. Um, but everything about the notation, whether it's obviously functional, whether it's a pitch and a rhythm or something, or non-functional, has something to do with the musical content of the work in a way I'm reluctant to sort of specify further, that it can have an influence on the sounding presentation in concert, but even in that case, the sound the audience hears is not necessarily the entirety of the content of the work, or even necessarily a totally reliable guide to what that content is. Um, and this way, thinking of my work this way leads to charges and has led to charges of, you know, the fetishization of notation and Augenmusik and mannerism, um, all of which I grat gratefully and happily plead guilty to, um, <laughs> with the proviso that I really think that a lot of the notational practice of contemporary music could use a little bit more fetishization, um, a little bit more, you know, a little bit more ugly music. So that's number one. Number two is the role of detail and ornament in my work. Um, this nor normal relationship, of course, between detail and structure, or um, ornament and fundament, um, of foreground and middle ground. This is, you know, Aaron mentioned Froberger that this, uh, this for me is a more or less private reference to the practice of the French Baroque keyboard repertoire, which as he mentioned is one of my musical passions, um, particularly the keyboard practice in which the, you have the notated analyzable substance of a piece by someone like Francois Couperin, um, which on paper looks a little bit trivial. You know, it has an easy meter and a nice tune maybe and straightforward harmonic content for the most part. Um, but that's merely a pretext for the scaffolding, right? It's, it's on the undergrowth and the cracks where the ornaments come in, where the keyboard improvisatory practice comes in, that's the real focus and the real substance of the work. Um, I've spoken at length about this elsewhere and the way it impacts my work, and I'm happy to talk your ear off about it later, but that's just a brief summary of that. But the idea here is that the detail in my work is continually overwhelming the ostensible structure, right? There are pitch structures here, there are gestures, there are melodic content, there is harmony. Um, and instead of being restricted to cracks, to opening out internal rhetorical worlds, you know, between the notes, right, between the harmonies, here the detail and ornament and everything else overwhelms, it undermines, it dissolves boundaries and forms a layer of gauze and makes it hard maybe to perceive the, um, the underpinning, the melodic or harmonic or rhythmic or gestural sense. But there's something struggling to assert itself that can't because of the overwhelming detail. And you can see the, con the relationship to the Durer drawing, I think, in this particular case. Um, and this leads to an interest which I've talked about at great lengths before, whenever I've talked about my work in the past, in unclarities and ambiguities and inefficiencies and notation and performance and, and compositional process. A general area of thinking for me that's really closely tied up with notational practice in particular in the act of making the score by hand and in such overwhelming detail and so forth. Um, number three is the use and the deployment of physical and instrumental limitations. Um, I used to be a lot more interested than I am now in like testing the physical capabilities of performers in a sense of endurance and strain and muscular strain and respiratory strain um, and in weaponizing that sense of strain and extremity and exhaustion for expressive ends. 
um, the piece I wrote for Elysian 10 years ago that sort of the highlight, the high point of that for me. Um, and the interest remains for me a decade later in instrumental boundary conditions. Um, and the edges of the instrumentally possible, the edges of the instrumentally plausible in regions where things may or may not sound or may not sound stably or predictably or may work somewhat <coughs> against, excuse me, the instrument's strengths or design. Um, I'm interested also in period instruments and early instruments. I have a piece for Baroque violin, a piece for 18th century clarinet, um, which I love because they make these cracks and, and um, failures, they're, 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 more, they're more present than early instruments. They're, the instruments are not as perfected and not as um, ideal. Um, what's changed in the decade or so since I was writing those violent, strained pieces is the increasingly dominant role that extreme quiet has played in my work. Um, and the attendant marginal sounds of vocabulary of creaks and hisses and pops and failed things and silence, of course. Um, they have become a really important part of the musical material for me. Um, my work's been mostly pretty quiet for a long time, almost since the beginning of the work that I sort of acknowledge from 2002, 2003 or so. But in the last six or seven years, it's accelerated quite significantly and become almost exclusively quite extraordinarily quiet. So the strains and concentrations that interest me these days more are the strain and concentration is not of palpable extreme exertion, but of balancing on a point, um, on not letting things slip, on maintaining the sort of knife edge <coughs> control, excuse me, even or especially when the result of that control is this sort of wavering, slippery, marginally graspable sound, which is another way in which sound is not the most reliable guide to the work. And the last one, before I'm going to take a swig of water, the last one, which is sort of a summary or an encapsulation of the previous three, is an unremittingly intense focus on the experience, cognitive, muscular, attentional, instrumental, physical, memorial, memory-based, of the individual performer as a human being in the act of playing the piece. And this has a lot to do with the notation. You may have seen aspects of my notation that are private messages to performers. Um, Expressive indications over rests, for instance, or things in quotation marks. Things that don't sound like anything, but things that are part of the performer's mental state. And this way of doing things arose in conjunction with and resonated with this um, circumstance where I, was, I wrote a lot of pieces for small ensembles or soloists when I was developing this language. So I became really, really focused on that experience. And then, of course, that turns over and this becomes my world. And I start writing more pieces for soloists and small ensembles because that's what I know how to do. This string quartet at the time was sort of a large ensemble for me, four players. Um, after this piece, I wrote six solos in a row, for instance, over the space of two or three years. But the idea is that the material of music exists for me. I can say that you know, quite strongly. It has its power and it has its reason for being insofar as it's constantly in dialogue with a performer's state, their mental state, their attention, their musculature, but also their sort of subjective, emotional, <laughs> sort of material mental state with the minutiae of their actions and their attentions, which sometimes are intentionally overloaded, sometimes emptied out, so they wind up focusing on almost nothing for an extended period of time. And that's the sort of push and pull of my work. So even here in the quartet, there's this strange balance between the solipsistic, right, between the completely absorbed individual in their own instrument with their air vibrating inches in front of them, inches in front of their instrument. And then there's this strangely sort of provisional dynamic with the rest of the ensemble. In the, by the way, in this piece, the performers are meant to be sitting in a circle facing each other as closely as they can without literally interfering with each other's arms and bows and so forth. Um, and when it was premiered, unbeknownst to me, they set up the, the space in the round, which is really nice. They were in the center of the space and the audience was surrounding it, which increases the, the sense in which, of course, you get the sense that the players are talking to themselves, talking to each other, and that the audience is, you know, they're not necessarily intruding, <laughs> but they are overhearing, they're listening and they're eavesdropping essentially on this very private thing. So those, and so those are the key points, I think, the, those four things in the way that I've historically tended to conceive of my work for myself, or at least that I've tried to conceive it in a form that's presentable in a context like this, right? If I had to verbalize what my work does, these four things, the notation, the score is medium, detail, you know, the physical intensity of quiet and instrumental limitation and overall the experience of the individual performer. Um, and I think you can see how these things all have a lot to do with each other. They all overlap. They all point in one sort of direction that is my musical being, right? It's, my, it's why I write music. It's, why, it's what interests me about music. It's all these things. So broadly speaking, 
I'm more or less comfortable saying I was writing music like this, like that, and had been since 2012 or so, maybe, in terms of quiet, extreme quiet and sparsity and that sort of thing. Um, and even the pieces from before that demarcation line I built for myself in 2012, those pieces, the earlier ones tend to be denser, they tend to be more extreme in their purely physical demands, as I mentioned, and not always so unbelievably extremely quiet, maybe just quite quiet. Um, but they share this concern with ornament and detail and most definitely the intensive focus on what the performer is doing with the score and how they think and how they act and how they feel in every moment of the piece, including the silent moments. So then, of course, what happened was that I was asked to write for orchestra. Um, I mentioned that the main features of my work evolved in reaction to writing almost exclusively for soloists and for very small ensembles, and that, in, that continued focus influenced the further course of the work towards writing more for soloists and small ensembles. At the point at which I was approached with this orchestra thing, the largest ensemble I'd ever worked with in a piece that I would acknowledge having written, really, was nine players. And in that piece, most of the time, only four or five of them were playing at once. And so when I got this email, I was really tempted to say no. Um, I, I kind of always, I'd always said to myself, if I'm ever asked to write for orchestra, I'll, I'll say no, you know? Um, <laughs> because it, it felt like, it, it would have felt like a principled stand, right, in defense of my musical personality, right? Um, the sense that I wouldn't be selling out or, you know, being ambitious or whatever, or careerist, that I would sort of, that it's not what my music was doing, it's not what I was as a composer. Um, that it would have been true to myself and to the strength and the weaknesses of my style, because every style has weaknesses, right? Things that it's not, <laughs> that it's not sort of meant for, that it's not um, conducive to. True to my own boundaries, so that set of preconditions to my own compositional practice with which I'd become quite comfortable, which had enabled my working process in a way that I recognized it. Um, and which became, as I said, what my music was and what I was as a musician. And I'll talk more about this later, but this, aside from that, I'd also, you know, for myself, and I'm not trying to make any sort of objective statements here, but I've always been and I remain kind of suspicious of a lot of contemporary orchestra music. Um, even maybe especially that of composers who I really generally quite admire um, and who have been quite influential on my, my own way of working in my own music and who I <laughs> often sort of aspire to get, you know, to emulate in some sort of superficial sense. I like that sound, I like that approach, I like that philosophy. Um, but I'm suspicious of these composers' orchestral music and its relationship to a set of received notions of orchestrality that exists in this sort of floating space independent of one's particular interests, right? Of one's particular proclivities and that warps his interests. I mean, a lot of musical institutions do this. I don't need to tell you this. That um, that's sort of what a musical institution is. It exists to warp individual composers' interests, um, including, for example, the idea of a string quartet as an established ensemble with its own rehearsal practices and so forth. Um, and then, of course, specific ensembles, specific performers, commissioning bodies, festival directors, you know, I don't need to explain this to you. But in the case of the orchestra, there really does or did seem to me to be something almost aggressive about it, something sort of territorial, right? Something having to do with things both musical and non-musical, things that are societal and financial and logistical and legal, contractual, you know, um, and more importantly, these, all these things are seem to me to be aimed with an almost eerie degree of precision directly against all of my prevailing musical instincts, which is the real point. Like, and um, not that the orchestra is a bad thing, that not that we should blow up the orchestra houses, but that it, it seems just, you know, like the opposite of me, the emphasis on the mass result, right, on consensus, on centrality, on the sort of sanding down of the individual musician in service of the greater good, the idea of bright colors. Um, I, my sketchbooks are almost entirely words, and I write words like pale, gray, white, tan, um, more, more and more often in my sketchbooks lately. But the idea, you know, the idea of primary colors, the idea of you know, coloristic contrast is completely anathema to the way that I think about instruments. And then there's the authoritarian wielding of volume, right? Volume, both oral volume and spatial volume, architectural volume this publicness, this facing outward, this declaring authority over a space. All of these things are, again, as you are probably now well aware, these are just all these things, antonyms of the things that interest me about making music. Um, so once I said yes, as I obviously did, um, my goal, had the, it had to be to write the least orchestral piece that I possibly could, in general terms. Um, and one way of doing that would have been to try and undo the orchestra, right? Use a lot of auxiliary instruments or not have a conductor or have 17 conductors or, or, or something like this, or do a, you know, a cage sort of, you know, 100 soloists simultaneously sort of thing. Um, and 
one, as I said, I listen to a lot of orchestral music by a lot of composers I love. And the, my favorite orchestra piece by my list of favorite composers is by James Saunders. And it's a piece called Geometria Situs, which is a beautiful, beautiful piece. And I, I would, one of the pieces I would have loved to have written. But at the same time, there's a lot of, you know, everyone is playing styrofoam a lot of the time. You know, the oboists are rubbing styrofoam. And it's a beautiful sound, but I just decided very early on I didn't want to do that. It seemed to be sort of avoiding the problem. And decided that if I was going to do this, I was going to do this in a way that I sort of had to come to terms with what I was doing. And I love that piece, but I also feel like it's kind of cheating in terms of writing an orchestra piece for the SVR or whatever, whatever it was. So I set out to make a piece for the orchestra, for a normal orchestra, more or less, operating fundamentally as it's accustomed to operating, but as colorless as possible, as private as possible, as devoid of volume and as devoid of persuasive rhetoric as possible, without assertions of mass, without public pageantry, without a persuasive sense of unified and unambiguous purpose, um, as I said, sort of as unorchestral as possible. So those are the general conditions that I set for myself. And I could give you a long list, and you could probably now give me a long list beyond, beyond that, beyond the general, of a long list of specifics, things about my work, elements of my work that are useless in this context, that are worse than useless, that are counterproductive or impossible or destructive to the purpose of writing a piece for orchestra. Um, a lot of the things I've mentioned, you know, the handwriting of the score, start there. The way I'm used to writing out music, which is absolutely an integral part of the compositional process for me. I'm changing things as I have the pen in my hand, and the act of drawing the notes is part of the, you know, it's, the, it's a chance to make a decision, over, you know, thousands of decisions in every, on every page. Um, this idea of focusing on the individual internal experience of the performer, that is not how an orchestra rehearsal goes. I don't, you know, let me assure you. Um, forgetting things like the rhythmic specificity, you know, I, I refuse to use the word complexity because it's not, that's irrelevant, but this, you know, the detailed rhythmic writing, that's not how orchestra rehearsals go either. Um, this idea of the score as medium, which I said earlier was like the, my banner as a composer, like the thing I would, you know, I go to the mattresses for, the idea that that sound is not the medium, that notation is the medium. Well, not, not, in this, not this time. Um, this is, as you'll see, this is the first piece in a long time that, well, the first piece ever, as you'll see, that someone else engraved the score. Um, the first piece in over a decade of mine that was made on a computer, the score. So since I didn't end up saying no to the request to make this piece, the very first thing I had to do was fundamentally reevaluate all these axioms that I presented to you. And I, I had to discover, I, so I put myself this question, and this is, um, word for word, something, you know, I wrote this in my sketchbook. What was left of my work, what is left of my work, when it's stripped of all those trappings that make it a comfortable place for me to inhabit as a composer? What, if anything, is identifiably mine about my own work when the things that made it immediately recognizable as mine, both to me and to others, are stripped away? Um, and this is a really difficult thing. It was surprised, I knew it would be hard. I was surprised how painful it was to have to confront all these things. Um, because I had built all these things by force of habit, one at a time, brick by brick, over a decade or so, without intending to build myself an edifice, but building myself an edifice nonetheless. Um, and this is also where the idea of a brand comes back, something I don't want to totally dismiss as, you know, as sort of hopelessly whatever, um, mercantilist and capitalist and whatever, because what a brand is just a sort of outwardly directed style. Um, in my case, that's tied up quite inextricably with the appearance of my scores. Um, it's understandably the first thing people tend to notice about my work. When people like my work, it's one of the things they tend to like about it. Um, when I have a concert, my scores are often the poster. The Facebook event page header image is often an excerpt from one of my scores. I'm sort of used to that by now, not, you know, not because it's the best piece in the program, but because the score is eye-catching. Um, and that became, you know, even things like that become part of the armature, part of the scaffolding of how I self-identify as a composer. You know, I'm the guy with the pretty scores. <laughs> you know, this, this sort of thing. Um, and it was very difficult to, to decide how to proceed in the absence of this. It, and it penetrates quite deeply into my working method, my way of understanding my own working method and why it works and how it works and how to prioritize the different steps and what, you know, at what point, you know, sketches become music, everything, absolutely everything. That, and some of the stuff I had been very hard won for me over the past few years, reevaluating the way I worked and um, learning to get over some of my own hitches. So figuring out how to make a piece that would still be by me in a sense that was recognizable to me in this context was even more difficult than I anticipated. Um, but leaving all the, you know, the psychoanalysis behind, it also involved redefining the axioms of the style within the limitations of the situation in which I found myself, because it was, for me, a very limiting situation. And so, um, you know, when I told people I was running for orchestra, before it became sort of a public thing, when I was telling my friends and colleagues, 
every time the reaction is, but you know, what? <laughs> How? Like, what the hell are you going to do? Um, and after a lot of false starts and a lot of frustration and a lot of even more than the usual helping of self-doubt, which is always an integral part of my compositional process, um, you can ask my wife about that. Uh, in particular, after listening to a lot of orchestra music, as I said, by a lot of composers who I love and always finding it a little bit, this is, this is not right. This is not, this isn't, that I can't do this. Um, I eventually settled on a, com on a conceptual framework, um, a way of existing within the orchestral condition that I decided, or I came to realize, I'm not quite sure which, um, hovers behind everything I said before about my pre-existing composition, compositional axioms, about that vague, uh, cloudy region that all those axioms were pointing to that isn't as dependent on all these anti-orchestral strategies that permeated everything about my working method, my self-identification as what I was as a composer. And as it turns out, that framework had to, had to do with the idea of instability as an umbrella concept. Um, for years, up to and including earlier this afternoon, I've used terms like obscurity and unclarity and ambiguity to describe the state of my compositional materials. I've talked about veiling things and drowning them and hiding them, as in the title of this talk. Um, but I say again that unclarity and ambiguity and hiding and drowning are not necessarily useful or productive concepts for the framing of musical intention in an orchestral setting. I was terrified of the rehearsal process. So what do I mean by instability in a way that's compatible with such a process? Um, as a first example of what I mean and what I decided could become the basis of my compositional style for this context, I want to talk about an element of the quartet I haven't mentioned, except in passing which is this idea I alluded to in the context of the Durer sketch, which is, which is this idea of negative space. As you may recall, this is a 12 minute piece and the first seven and a half minutes are for the two violins. Um, sometimes just for one of the violins and sometimes for one of them holding a note or sometimes doing nothing. While the other two instruments sit on stage silently waiting their turn. Um, and this sort of radical imbalance, this asymmetrically distributed negative space is something that's increasingly become a common feature in my work. Um, to the point that I'm more concerned about it becoming sort of a, a tick or a habit than something fully thought through and fully felt. But I like to think of the resulting, the formal trajectories that result, the inherent instability and having to modulate the fluctuating pressure of expectation, right, of musicians sitting silently, sitting inert as a generator of large scale formal instability, sort of a sense of potential energy. Um, a sense of gradual instability and global imbalance, which becomes almost a physical pressure. Um, I used to a lot, six or seven years ago when I gave talks, and I talk about these pieces I mentioned that are sort of really exhausting and strained and, and exhaust the players and wear them out. And I showed a video by Richard Serra, um, the sculptor, called Hand Led Fulcrum, which I should have brought today, but I didn't, because um, it just occurred to me a couple days ago to talk about it. But what it is, is a video of Richard Serra holding in his hand a hunk of lead with a tight frame around sort of his forearm and his hand. And in six or seven minutes, him sort of gradually failing to be able to hold that heavy, super heavy thing up anymore with an extended arm. And you see it sort of tremble, and then you see it fall very gradually. Um, and this has, this is sort of the instability, the, the idea of potential energy and the idea of sort of coiled tension through negative space that I became really interested in exploring in this piece. Um, and to me, and this is a bit hard to communicate, um, but I'm not doing musicology here, I'm just telling you how I feel. Um, it has a similar valence to me to the more local types of instability that emerge in my more, you know, the way I'm used to working. This idea that it withholds something, right? That there's something there in the material, and this, in the material in this case being the ensemble itself, that is being withheld, that you can't access. Um, a potential rhetorical familiarity, how a string quartet goes, the sonority of the full ensemble, that is there, that's latent on stage, but is buried. And of course, when you're dealing with an orchestra, the potential for imbalancing weights and volumes is infinitely greater. Um, the ensemble in my piece is something like 85 players. Um, the potential for this almost physical instability, the sense of things being off center. And this is one of the senses in which I right away knew I wanted to use the orchestra to really take advantage of this opportunity to have, especially to have them not play. Um, which is you know, paradoxical, maybe a little bit obnoxious, um, but by refusing the orchestral sonority, by building in a really imbalanced temporal structure of off-center weightings and these sort of tense potential energies in which most of the orchestra does nothing most of the time. And so the focus is, again, as I, am, as I like it to be, and can be on individuals, tiny groups, um, but an individual here as marginalized, right, as frail, as, as unstably trying to prop up an orchestra's worth of music um, on their own individual shoulders, as you'll see that, you'll see that in operation. Um, 
so the, the kind of instability that's present in my work, my pre-existing work, is sort of a depth model, right? There's something beneath the surface, and the surface is wiped over so you can't get at it. And then this becomes sort of a horizontal model, a durational model of instability, right? And the form generating model, a way of thinking about the distribution of material in time, and a way of thinking about orchestration and instrumentation, and a way of thinking about durations and silence. And so I came, I, I love making phrases that find up my sketchbooks. I write over and over again, and they, I use them whenever I can. And this one became, for me, emergent instability. An instability on the formal level that emerges gradually over the course of a piece, this in fundamental imbalance. And for me, the, the powerful imbalance of 82 musicians not playing um, became one of the motivating factors for the piece. So that's instability, one species. Another is another type of sort of horizontal instability, but one that hews sort of closer to the time scale and the focus on the experience of the individual, individual event, the individual impulse, the individual gesture, um, which is something that in my phrase minting mode I started to call accretive instability, which is a phrase that's really become important to me in the work I'm doing right now, and actually. Um, I'm not proposing some sort of formal taxonomy of instabilities. These are just words that I made up for myself that have, have until this very moment been totally private. And what I mean by this is a particular approach to articulation, to, by which I mean the claiming of a duration for an event, right? the way that a single event takes up space in time in a way that creates or materially suggests a sort of provisionality or hesitation or insecurity, a sort of rhetorical instability, some sort of unwillingness or inability to govern a duration firmly through restatements. And concretely what I mean by that is a, an articulation universe of restatements irregularities, stutterings, um, constant circlings back, um, unwillingness to progress, a sense that you know, a, an event in time can't be smoothly or stably stated, but has to be sort of stuttered into imbalanced, you know, almost falling off the tightrope sort of way. Um, so if you picture, whatever, um, like a solid ball as a stable event, my, in the quartet, that ball is destabilized by being, you know, maybe having the surface cracked or having something put in front of it so you can't see it. And this idea I have of accretive instability is the ball sort of in pieces <laughs> strung out along a line. Um, this started for me in my desperate search for a way to write productively for piano, which is something I struggled with for a very long time. Um, I wrote a piece for two pianos in 2013, which actually was um, played here the last time I was here um, at the festival. And it has totally taken over the rhetoric and the only significant piano writing I've done since, which was a piece that I finished earlier this year um, for saxophone, percussion, and piano, which has a bunch of piano solos that are really just sort of like stuttering on, on individual chords and overlapping events and looping back in the sort of like almost this incredibly halting, incredibly sort of unstable navigation of a very, very small space. space. And again, to me, without necessarily trying to defend it on logical grounds or to persuade you that A leads to B, um, this sort of articulation is also a way of reframing the same general, the same subjectively defined aesthetic desires for a sense of hesitation, a sense of lack of confidence, of unclarity, um, with a different and maybe a more um, translatable technical vocabulary. And it's also related to this emergent instability thing as well, the idea of events taking up time in an awkward manner, in an unstable manner, in a provisional manner, um, ex events existing in a space that is not the right size for them. It's either too big in space or too big in time. And that, start, that sort of thing is, I think, became the thing that became the core idea, the core premise of the orchestra piece. And so the key thing to summarize about these species of instability is that they are not inherently unsuited to, they're not inherently contraindicated by the orchestral situation in all its meanings, the practical, the logistical, the notational, the expressive. Um, they are meant to be translations of an attitude of a sort of intuitive aesthetic predisposition and a way of working that doesn't in fact wind up requiring this fanatical focus on detail, this compulsive accretion of ornamental and physically distortive layers that is normally how I work, um, the notational ambiguities and attempts at sort of psychological suggestion by manipulating the conventions of notation, um, all those things that make the bulk of my work utterly unsuited to, to an orchestra. Um, but so there are ways at getting, of getting at a similar attitude to material and duration and form and a similar skepticism of the confident and fully unified musical gesture, which is one thing that binds my work together over the last 15 years or so, just a skepticism of confidence, you could say, a distrust of confidence. Um, so the one last question before I pivot to actually talking about this piece specifically and playing it for you 
is what I haven't addressed really is the question of the local material, that which is articulated, that which is stuttered over, and that which is unstably presented um, and distributed irregularly and in a productively unbalanced way across the instrumental apparatus and across the duration of the work. And here is where I could actually use the orchestraness of the orchestra in a positive way. Um, in particular, there's a full string section, um, 10, 10, 10, 6, 4. But there's no doubling. Um, every string player has their own part, although, thank God, most of them don't do anything the vast majority of the time. Um, I'm, uh, I'm not an idiot, you know. Um, and unsurprisingly and kind of uninnovatively, maybe the strings, the, uh, this exploded string ensemble is the backbone of the piece, it's the driver of the piece. And what the writing is meant to do is to take what's a really simple, spare, slow-moving harmonic line, a really an intervallic line, um, sort of cantus firmus, that is quite static itself and, and has trouble leaving a couple core pitches based on the open strings, um, and layering it with countless little echoes of itself between the instruments, the strings in particular. They're sometimes off-center, they're sometimes marginal, they're barely audible, they're coloring each other, the little flickers past passed around the stage. This con so the result is constantly changing, constantly flickering, but also quite static and quite slow moving field, which I was thinking of as an orchestration, sort of a writing out, an expansion of the sort of, precisely the sort of unstable timbres that you get in a piece like the string quartet. Um, the sound of a bow being drawn too slowly over a string, for instance, um, or a fluttering, unstable left hand finger pressure or a harmonic that's not quite on a node, but maybe slides past it and goes back, this sort of thing. And it wasn't a question of spectral analysis or software, I don't, I don't do any of that stuff, but it was more metaphorical. The idea that this, um, that I could treat a normal violin timbre in the string quartet, and I could treat the normal timbre of, you know, the talus fantasia or something, of the string ensemble of an orchestra um, in that way, in this piece, again, without needing these fragilities and extremities of individual technique. Um, so it's a really the typical timbral language of my work exploded and orchestrated. So you have this focus on instability, you have this simplicity and the transparency of the fundamental material, you have this accretive instability idea which you'll hear really specifically at the beginning, I think, and also at the end with two very different material types. And you wind up, where you wind up is this space of, as you know, the title of this alludes to, this evacuation of a wide open space. Um, this destabilizing of, of rhetoric, this, de, this, this desaturation of color, but the material itself is blank, right? The material is very faintly traced, the sort of light, light gray figures with a very dull pencil on an off-white piece of paper sort of, sort of thing. Um, so now I think it's probably time to start actually talking about the piece itself and playing it for you, because I've been talking a lot. Um, the piece, let me pull it up here. If I can wake my computer up, which I can. to the title page for the sake of rhetoric. Um, the piece is called Measurement as Contrition, Three Canons, through the orchestra. And the three canons are in fact there. That's something in my work I have not talked about and don't have time to talk about. I'm not really relevant for my topic. Um, almost all my work is based around canonic thinking of some form or other, although it's almost never actually audible as canons. Um, but it's a way of generating material, a way of thinking about time and gesture and the way that counterpoint works. Um, almost everything in my work starts as um, a mensural canon of some sort or other, and very complicated and folded up in unorthodox ways. You can hear it a bit in the beginning if you use your imagination, I think, which is, whoop, which is an extended um, passage for th mostly for three solo violins doing almost nothing. Um, but anyway, the placement of larger ensemble moments, their internal machinations is, and then the stuff that happens at the end, a little bit more lyrical stuff. Anyway, the title, let's get, stay on the title page. Um, the main part of the title, Measurement as Contrition, comes from the uh, Pope Gregory the Great, of all places, and his homilies on the book of Ezekiel. Um, I, there's a book by Francis Yates called The Craft of Memory, um, and anyone who's interested in the intellectual history of the Middle Ages, which I assume is all of you, um, should read this book and her others. She's a towering intellectual figure, as far as I'm concerned, if you haven't already. But the book is about, in fact, the craft of memory, by which she means um, the structures of thought that facilitated and were born from a memory culture. Not a pre-literate culture, of course, but sort of a culture that was still kind of literate. It was pre-print and it was literature, literacy skeptical, in a sense, in the higher echelons. Um, memory becomes a creative force, right? It becomes a meditative force. 
a lot of this has to do with architecture. You might be, you know, you might have heard of the idea of a memory palace or a memory, um, memory arena, this imagined hypothetical, hypothetical architectures. But anyway, in the book of Ezekiel, speaking of out, you know, weird proportions and things that go on too long, um, there's this really long passage in Ezekiel. Um, but some hefty percentage of the book of Ezekiel is a description in really painstaking detail the architectural details and dimensions of a building that doesn't exist and didn't exist, which is his Ezekiel's vision of the future temple of Jerusalem. He describes its dimensions in great detail, like how, where the windows are, how big the windows are, what the window, what the frames of the windows are like. Um, it's on and on and on and on and on. And it's always been sort of a puzzle, I think, to people what, why, this is, why he was so interested in this, um, why he thought we should know of all this stuff. But what Pope Gregory then suggests in, you know, 1080, give or take, coming before, 880, or proposes he, that this meditation of Ezekiel's is a penitential exercise, that a penitent, a m Christian meditator, can work to reconstruct this building mentally, can memorize, having memorized the book of Ezekiel, of course, as one does, um, he can rebuild in his mind um, the Temple of Jerusalem in painstaking detail as a particularly abstract form of moral exercise, as penance. And I loved this idea, this idea of the image of this measurement and delimitation of empty spaces as a moral calling. Um, this meditation upon proportion and balance as a means of elaborating and writing and reconceiving one's own being. And this is really speaking my language, I have to say. Um, and I think it's clear on the surface to the listener, even to the listener who hasn't heard me talk about this for the past 45 minutes or whatever, um, that this piece is for all my talk about instabilities and methods of decentering um, and technical challenges about and about, about the necessity of avoiding the orchestra and ways of doing so productively, that really this piece is about empty spaces and empty volumes at the end of the day. Um, so I'll play it for you now. Um, it's about 17 minutes long. This is the performance. It's the BBC Scottish Symphony with Ilan Volkov from the Tectonics Festival about a little less than a year ago. Um, I do feel the need to issue a slight disclaimer, which is that this is a, a recording made by the BBC. Um, bless their hearts. And it was... Um, you know, it's, it's, their microphones are on the stage. And a lot of this piece in performance is about the fact that you are in the audience and this orchestra is back there, right? And that there are violins over there and the violins is a tiny instrument compared to the size of the hall and it was written to be heard in a big hall. Um, and it, none of that really works in the recording um, because the recording is meant to sound good on the radio, which is a completely different, um, different beast altogether. My music is not meant to sound good on the radio. So anyway, you can use your imagination. I think it's not that difficult to do. So this is measurement as contrition, three canons in this very, very not Evan Johnson looking score. <laughs> 
OK, so the question then, of course, is, is this what my work is really about? Is this what my work has been about all along? Um, instability in wide open spaces um, with the details and the ornamentations and the notational quirks as, if not quite optional accessories, then at least you know, a layer beneath which there is another layer. Um, vacant spaces juxtaposed, containing the sort of ungraspable material, masking a latent but inaccessible stability where very little actually happens. Um, despite the welter of details in my work, its intricacy and its extreme difficulty, its calligraphic extravagance, um, is it really about simplicity and about nothingness, nothingnesses and their imbalance? And the answer is I really honestly don't know. Um, and I'm still thinking about it. And in a sense, all my work since this piece um, has been and will likely continue for a while to be an attempt to answer the question for myself to my own satisfaction and to figure out what my style actually is.